Hey everybody, Zenny here. I've been saying for a while that I wanted to redo some of my tutorials and make some new ones as well. Hopefully this is the start of that. I've done some general movement tutorials in the past, and if you've seen those, you probably won't find any completely new information in this one. You might enjoy the presentation more, I'm hoping it will be better quality overall, and this should have more data about the inputs being done so that you can see and hopefully learn better and more efficiently. Movement in Super Metroid is the number one contributing factor to going fast. Of course, there are plenty of cool tricks and glitches that can be performed too, but many of those rely on solid movement as well. If you want to get better at speedrunning Super Metroid, one of the best ways that you can spend your time is refining your movement. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Before I get into the game itself, I want to talk about control schemes, the controller itself, and different grips you can utilize to access more buttons on the controller at the same time, to help you move Samus more efficiently. When you go to start your game in Super Metroid, the first thing you should do is access the controller setting mode option in the file that you've selected. You need to set this up before you start, as it cannot be changed in the normal version of the game after you have started. When you're choosing what action to map to which button, there are some key considerations that you should make. How large are your hands? Are you able to use a claw grip to push buttons with your index fingers? Will you be relying on a fat finger approach to pressing three buttons at the same time? The face buttons on the Super Nintendo controller are not all evenly spaced from one another. There is a slightly greater distance between Y and A than there is between X and B. This is important to note, as it may determine how you choose to map your shoot, jump, and dash buttons, respectively. I chose to map shoot to Y, jump to B, and dash to A. My reasoning was that I wanted shoot and jump to be next to each other so that I could more easily hold both buttons at the same time without accidentally pressing buttons that I didn't mean to. Gradually, over time, I've adapted to holding A, dash, with a claw grip, which I do in most rooms now. Most players also switch the item select and item cancel mappings. Selecting missiles, super missiles, power bombs, grapple beam, and x-ray using the select button, which is default, is extremely cumbersome and difficult to do quickly. The popular opinion is that the item cancel function is much easier to use on the select button, as it's required far less often and never needs to be pressed quickly repeatedly. You also have the angle up and angle down buttons to consider here. You might have thought to yourself, why not map item select or another action to L or R? The reason for this is that the game won't allow you to map angle up or angle down to any buttons except L and R. See how it says off there? So if you're playing on original hardware, this isn't an option for you. It is worth noting that the leaderboards allow you to use alternative controllers, keyboards, and hitboxes. If you can find a way to use one of those, the only rule is that each action may only be mapped to one button, and each button may only be mapped to one action. So you can't have dash on both A and L2, for example. There are a few runners out there, most notably Behemoth87, that have simply chosen to sacrifice their angle down button for the comfort of having an action mapped to L or R. There are lots of disadvantages to doing this. For example, having one less button to arm pump with, being unable to aim angled down without moving forward at the same time, and being unable to straight jump when you have a shine spark charged or a spike suit held. Ultimately, it's up to you, but I advise against it. Once you've chosen a control scheme, choose End to save your changes. Coming back to the first menu here, you also need to come into the special setting mode. In here, you should turn on the Moonwalk setting. It is off by default. Moonwalk is required to do a glitch called Moonfalling, which saves lots of time in the speedrun. Even if you choose not to moonfall in your runs, moonwalking is extremely powerful movement tech for positioning Samus. It might feel awkward at first, as it means you can't normally turn around while holding shoot. But the longer you wait to turn it on, the harder the transition will be. So this is something that I definitely advise turning on from the start. Okay, just a couple more things before we get into actually moving Samus. First off, I want to talk about different controller grips. The three main grips that I use are the standard grip, the claw grip, and the piano grip. 
There's also a special grip specifically for Zodan pumping, which I'll cover later. Please, please, please keep in mind that comfort should always come first. Your hands are a priceless tool for many things in life that are more important than speedrunning Super Metroid. If you're having hand pain, try to adjust the way that you're using your hands when you play. Don't push through the pain. Hands aren't like muscles that build up and get stronger when you push through it. You can seriously and permanently injure your hands and wrists if you try to just tough it out. The standard grip is exactly what you would expect. You hold the controller naturally, push the D-pad with your left thumb, the face buttons with your right thumb, and the L and R buttons with your index fingers. The claw grip involves wrapping an index finger around to press face buttons, or some people do it with their left hand to press select, so that you don't have to stop using your thumbs while they're pressing other buttons. I claw the A button a lot. Some people claw X as well. The main disadvantage to the claw grip is that now your index finger is busy pressing one of these buttons, and you can't press L or R. You can wrap your middle finger around to press L or R for you, but that's always been really uncomfortable for me. I only do it in one single strat across the entire game. There's also the piano grip, which I used to use very frequently before I started to use the claw grip. The piano grip is called this because you lay the controller flat and place your right hand across the controller like you would if you were playing the piano. This is extremely powerful for high actions per minute rooms, particularly the Metroid rooms in Turian at the end of the run. It can also simply be used for the comfort if you need to focus on holding more than one button at a time and can't comfortably reach all those buttons with just your thumb. With both the claw and piano grips, getting used to angling Samus's arm cannon on the D-pad is key. That way, you don't have to try and uncomfortably reach for L or R all the time while your index fingers are busy. Okay, last thing here, I promise specifically to help you with practicing everything that we're going to talk about. Super Metroid has an amazing practice ROM developed by some incredible people in the community. You can access it at smpractice.speedga.me. There's also a link on the Super Metroid speedrunning wiki at wiki.supermetroid.run. I'll leave links to both of these in the description on the video. The practice ROM has dozens of tools available to help you refine your practice. I'm going to quickly summarize them here. Probably the single biggest benefit to using the practice ROM is the ability to use save states built directly into the ROM. You can save a state by holding R, pressing select, and pressing Y, and then you can load a state by holding L, pressing select, and pressing Y. These hotkey configurations can also be changed in the menu. The next best thing about the practice ROM is the room times displayed in the top right. These will update in every door transition to tell you how much time you took to complete that room, and how many lag frames there were, and how long the door transition was, from top to bottom respectively. The numbers are read out in frames, and in real time by default, so 3.45 would be 3 seconds, 45 frames, or 3 and 3 quarters of a second. Some of these numbers can be adjusted in the menu to display other types of data, for example in-game time instead of real time. So as I leave the room here, you'll see that the numbers have updated. And if I leave the room more quickly, you'll see a different set of numbers. Open up the menu by pressing Start and Select at the same time on your controller. My version of the practice ROM is a custom build made by community member Insane Firebat. So yours may look slightly different, but most of the functionality is the same. The Practice ROM webpage has documentation that details what all of these options in the menu will do for you, but I'll run through some basics here as well. In the Equipment menu, you can choose what items Samus has. You can instantly refill all ammo and energy to full. You can choose a specific set of items, depending on which category you're practicing, or you can toggle individual items or beams on and off. There are also granular options for energy and ammo counts below. The Category Presets menu can take you to a specific part of the run for practice, kind of like teleporting to that exact point in the run. For example, if I wanted to practice Fantoon, I would choose Fantoon, and then Fantoon again, which will load me outside of the boss room. 
with all of the items that I would expect to have in the 100% run. There are many categories to choose from, which are all accessed in the Presets menu, directly below Category Presets. Choose Select Preset Category, and then choose whatever category you are wanting to practice. Save stations can teleport you to any save station on the map. Event flags can toggle which bosses are defeated, as well as other events that happen in the game. Miscellaneous options has some useful stuff as well. For example, toggling blue suit mode or flash suit mode for testing purposes, among other things. Probably the most useful thing in here, aside from the presets, is the info HUD menu. This menu allows you to customize what the information at the top of the screen while you're playing shows you. By default, I believe it's set to enemy HP or room strat. There are some really amazing options in here. The most useful one probably being room strat. Room strat works in conjunction with this other option to select which one you want to work on. And essentially, each of these will give you real-time feedback on your performance as you try to perfect a strat. For example, if you're trying to learn the Fantoon first any percent route, but you're struggling with a wall jump to get across the moat, there's a room strat for that called Moat CWJ. This will tell you how early or late you press the button to get the wall jump. The last thing I'm going to cover in this menu is RNG control. RNG control allows you to choose what RNG you want to see from bosses so that you can practice specific fantoon patterns, etc. This is extremely useful, and I highly recommend taking advantage of it. Again, there are tons of options in here, and if you have any questions about what something does, you can look for the documentation on the website, or you can join the Discord and ask for help in there. Look for a link in the video description. Okay, finally almost time to start talking about moving Samus. Super Metroid movement is extremely deep and intricate. This is mostly a good thing, as it gives you a lot of control over how you move Samus, and almost always leaves room to go even faster if you continue practicing. It can also be a frustrating thing at times, though, and makes for a pretty steep learning curve. As you learn how to speedrun Super Metroid, and if you choose to continue watching through my tutorials, there will be a lot of methods talked about for how to time specific actions. For example, jump when you see Samus pass X part of the background or terrain is a very common visual cue. Visual cues are extremely important for consistency when playing, so I highly encourage that you use them. A couple of things to note about using visual cues and trying to line them up with what other runners or my tutorials might tell you. First, you need to consider the possibility that you will be dealing with a certain level of input lag. If you're playing on original hardware with a CRT television, the game will feel extremely responsive as you will be dealing with the lowest level of input lag. If you use an upscaler and a modern display as opposed to a CRT, that will introduce some input lag. If you also use an emulator instead of a Super Nintendo console, that will introduce some as well. The more input lag you are playing with, the more difference there will be in what visual cues you will need to use. You also may find it more difficult to accurately control Samus. This can be adjusted to somewhat, but almost every single runner that I've ever spoken to has admitted that when they switched from emulator to a console and a CRT, there was a big difference in their experience, and they advanced very quickly after that. Another thing to consider about visual cues on modern displays is that modern displays typically have more motion blur than a CRT. This can make it difficult to visually identify a cue if the screen is scrolling fast, like when running with Speed Booster. If you are struggling to see the cue that has been identified by other runners, it might be a problem with your display and not necessarily with you yourself. Try to be patient with yourself as you are learning and practicing, and if one cue isn't working for you, try finding something else. So let's start moving Samus around. Like most 2D platformers, you control Samus by walking around with the D-pad. You can also use angles on the D-pad to aim Samus's arm cannon up or down, although it should be noted that she will also move forward automatically while doing this, and if you try to enter an angle down state while walking, she'll briefly stop. 
Alternatively, you can and should use the L and R buttons to angle down and angle up respectively. This brings us to our first little tip here. While walking Samus forward, or running forward, when you release the D-pad, Samus will continue moving for a brief period of time. This can make it difficult to stop precisely on an elevator, for example. However, if you hold an angle button, L or R, and then release the D-pad, Samus will stop immediately. This is called stopping on a dime, and is the most precise and consistent way to activate an elevator or stop in another precise position. If you've watched speedruns of Super Metroid, you've probably noticed players flying backwards after hitting an enemy or hitting some spikes. This is called damage boosting, or deboosting for short. It's performed by holding the jump button when taking damage and then pressing whichever direction is opposite of the direction that Samus is facing. So if she's facing left, you would press right to deboost right. If she's facing right, you would press left to deboost left. The timing window for a successful damage boost changes depending on what source Samus is taking damage from. Spikes have a longer window, and enemies have a shorter window. Enemy projectiles are even slightly shorter than enemies themselves, if I remember correctly. There are also different types of deboosts determined by whether you are holding forward or not when taking damage. If you are not holding forward when you take damage, Samus will boost up first. If you are holding forward when taking damage, Samus will boost down first. In both cases, after boosting up or down, you can then boost backwards. This is important to note for some specific deboost strats throughout the run, where sometimes you need to boost higher or lower in order to avoid bonking on the terrain as you fly backwards. There is also a frame-perfect forward damage boost, which occurs if you are holding forward when taking damage and then immediately switch the D-pad to back and then back to forward again. This is difficult to pull off consistently for humans, so it is not typically used in any strats. Let's talk about jumping versus falling. You might think that if Samus is in the air, she'll behave the same regardless, but that isn't the case. When Samus enters an airborne state because of a jump, she has different attributes than if she walked off a ledge or otherwise entered a falling state. More on that in a minute. The main reason this is important is because of a very common and useful piece of movement tech called a downback. A downback allows you to move Samus forward while aiming down. It's a bit counterintuitive, and I'm not sure why the code makes this happen exactly, but if Samus is in a falling state and you press down, and then while still holding down, you also press back on the D-pad, she will move forward while aiming down. Similar to damage boosts, if Samus is facing right, then back would be left on the D-pad. And if Samus is facing left, then back would be right. Samus enters a falling state after walking off a ledge, unmorphing in the air, or taking damage in the air. You cannot down back if Samus is not in a falling state. Trying to do so will simply make her turn around instead. While we're talking about jumping and falling, this is probably a good time to talk about moonfalls. Ironically, moonfalls are actually a jumping state, not a falling state. The moonfall is a glitch that allows Samus to fall downward after a jump at an increasing speed. Normally, when Samus falls or jumps off a ledge and begins falling, she has a maximum vertical speed cap. The moonfall glitch essentially removes this speed cap, so she continuously falls faster and faster. Moonfalling isn't always the faster way to fall down a room. 
but the longer the fall, the more time it will save. To execute a moonfall, the first thing you should do is hold the shoot button. While you have moonwalk enabled, holding shoot and pressing back will cause Samus to walk backwards without turning around. To moonfall, the easiest way to execute the glitch is to moonwalk while holding an angle button, L or R both work, do whatever is more comfortable for you, and then jumping without releasing the shoot button. It doesn't matter how long you hold jump for, Samus will always do a short jump in this state. After you jump, you want to release the angle button so that Samus doesn't unspin accidentally. If Samus does unspin, any time that you turn around, Samus's vertical speed reverts briefly, causing a slowdown in her descent. I guess while we're in climb, this is a good time to talk about wall jumps. Wall jumps in Super Metroid are very different from wall jumps in most other platformers. You can't simply be up next to a wall and press jump, and have Samus jump off the wall that way. Instead, you need to be in a spin animation next to the wall, and then press away from the wall, and then press jump. It's not a huge timing window, but it's not tiny either. When you press away from the wall in a spin pose, you'll see Samus enter a different pose. This is called a wall jump check, and indicates that if you press jump and you're close enough to the wall, the wall jump will occur. The pose looks different on the left and right sides, respectively. After a wall jump, you have the option to turn back towards the wall and repeat the inputs to do another wall jump. You can do this all the way up a single wall. The hardest part of wall jumping fast is not moving the d-pad in a way that will break Samus out of the spin pose. Something to keep in mind is that after jumping off of the wall, as long as you are still holding the jump button, pressing up will not break Samus out of spin pose unless you've turned around first. Pressing down, however, will cause her to automatically morph into the morphing ball. This is really useful for some strats throughout the run, but can be extremely frustrating if it happens unintentionally. After turning around back towards the wall, pressing up or down will both result in Samus breaking spin by either aiming up or down respectively. If this happens, you've broken the spin pose and will not be able to wall jump again until you've landed and re-entered a spin pose. To optimize your wall jumps, you should focus on releasing and repressing the jump button as quickly as possible. The longer you have jump released, the further back down Samus will fall. Only one frame of space is required for the gap between inputs, so the faster you're able to release and repress, the better. Alright, I think the next thing we should talk about is arm pumps. When you watch Super Metroid speedruns, you may have noticed that players are running around constantly spamming the angle buttons, aiming the arm cannon up and down repeatedly. This is called arm pumping. 
An arm pump occurs whenever Samus changes her pose, so going from neutral to angle up is an arm pump. Going back from angle up to neutral is also an arm pump. If Samus is running forward and you shoot, she goes from a neutral pose to an arm cannon forward pose. This is also an arm pump. Every time you arm pump, Samus moves forward one pixel. So it doesn't necessarily make Samus run faster, but it does help her move faster, if that makes sense. Let's look at some data here. Running forward from my save state, we got a 1247 room time. Here's a 1242. 1248. 1242. Now let's throw just casual arm pumping into the mix. 1233. 1234. 1229. Now let's do our best to arm pump as fast as we can. There's a 1232 again. 1226, 1226. So as you can see, arm pumping really does make a difference as you're running through rooms. One thing to note is that if arm pumps overlap with each other, you lose out on a pose change. What I mean by this is that if you go from angle up to neutral to angle down, you're getting three arm pumps. However, if you go from angle up and then before releasing angle up, you angle down, you're only getting two arm pumps. So if you're arm pumping with both L and R, it's best to try to space your pumps so that they don't overlap with each other. There's a tool in the practice ROM to help you optimize your arm pumps. Arm pump trainer. The numbers in the top left show you how you're performing. You can see how fast you're doing your arm pumps. It updates once every second and it will also tell you how many of them were overlapping with each other. That's the second number. Somewhat recently, a community member named Zodin had an idea of raking or hovering his fingernails across the shoulder button to very quickly arm pump on a single button. We call this Zodin pumping in Super Metroid. This allows players to arm pump at theoretically task level speeds, which is 30 presses per second but it has the huge disadvantage of requiring that your entire right hand be dedicated to nothing except the arm pumps. I use a special grip in series to Zodin pump through the first couple of rooms in the escape, and another one to arm pump down speed hallway when collecting speed booster. The speed booster Zodin pumps can save around half a second. It's not quite that useful anywhere else in the run though. Just for comparison, when I'm arm pumping with both L and R, I'm getting 6 pumps, 18 pumps, 15 pumps, 21 pumps, and of course some overlaps in those as well. If I do a Zodin pumping method, 29, 36, 41, obviously averaging much higher. My record for Zodin pumping is in the high 50s in a given second. One more thing to note about arm pumps. You generally shouldn't do them on any downward slopes. The reason for this is because since the arm pump is moving Samus one pixel forward, sometimes it will move her one pixel off of the slope into the air, which will cause her to fall and will be slow. You can always arm pump going up slopes, but not always going down slopes. See that? Some slopes are safe to arm pump on, for example, the slopes going down to speed booster. It depends on the steepness of the slope. If you're not sure of whether a slope is safe to arm pump on or not, simply don't do it. Next up, let's talk about ledge grabs. In order to understand how ledge grabs work, we need to talk about Samus's hitbox, and how it changes depending on what action or pose Samus is in. The practice ROM has a few types of hitbox viewers, so let's turn on the one for Samus. Come to Sprite Features, Show Samus Hitbox, turn that to On. Samus's hitbox is usually a vertical rectangle, 
covering the mid portion of her sprite. It adjusts in size as you do things like crouch, morph, spin jump, and shine spark. Here is a static image of Samus's various hitboxes. From left to right, smallest to biggest, you have morph, aim down, spin jump, crouch, and standing respectively. The way that ledge grabs work is by taking advantage of the fact that the spin jump hitbox is smaller than the standing hitbox. When spin jumping onto a platform, once you have cleared the edge of the platform so that you are above it, you want to break spin into a standing pose to make Stamus land earlier. The easiest way to do this is by pressing an angle button. It can also be accomplished by shooting or aiming up. If you don't expand Samus's hitbox, it takes longer for her to land on the platform. One thing to note is that if you are ledge grabbing with an angle button, best practice is to do that with angle down instead of angle up. The angle up pose has slightly different properties than the angle down pose in relation to how a jump out of a turn animation works. And also, if you press angle up when you have a shine spark charged, you will use your shine spark. If possible, you should generally ledge grab using angle down. Let's look at how ledge grabs work in slow motion. In slow motion, hopefully it will be a little bit easier for you to identify the actual expansion of Samus's hitbox out of a spin jump onto a ledge. There is also another type of ledge grab called a down grab. Down grabs are used to get up onto a ledge that you might otherwise not quite be able to reach, or occasionally simply to get onto a ledge slightly faster from a straight jump instead of a spin jump. If you recall the static image I showed earlier, the aim down pose has a very short hitbox. When you aim down while Samus is in the air, the bottom of her hitbox shrinks upwards, which can allow her to grab a ledge that she otherwise wouldn't be able to. Let's look at this in action right here. If I perform a normal straight jump from this position, Samus does not quite jump high enough to clear the edge of this platform below the door. However, if I aim down after jumping and then press forward near the top of the jump, you can see that Samus is able to grab the ledge instead of falling back down. Again, this is because the bottom of her hitbox shrinks upwards when aiming down. Not exactly relevant to ledge grabs specifically, but this is a good opportunity for another small tip and bit of knowledge. Samus jumps higher from a crouch pose than she does from a standing pose. Again, observe how Samus cannot clear this platform when jumping from standing, but she can from a crouch. One more small thing to note, if you're holding an angle button from a crouch, she will actually jump shorter than she normally would. Alright, one more bit about hitbox manipulation before we move on. Not only can the aim down pose be used for down grabs, it can also be used for something called a gap skip. Note the distance between these platforms is too large to simply run across. If you try, you will fall. The obvious solution here then is to jump across them instead. Another option with gaps like this is to run off the ledge and then aim down. Again, aiming down will shrink the bottom of Samus's hitbox upwards, which allows her to clear the gap without falling in. Up next, let's talk about what might be the single most powerful tool in Super Metroid's movement, the dash button. Part of the reason that Super Metroid's movement is so deep is because of the dash button. 
While modern games typically just have a character run by default, older games typically had a button to move faster. If you are not holding the dash button, Samus will walk slowly as opposed to running or dashing. While holding the dash button, Samus's run speed, or horizontal speed, gradually and granularly increases. It's not a simple walk speed is zero and run speed is one. The longer the button is held, the faster she runs, until she reaches maximum run speed. I've changed the numbers in the top left to reflect her horizontal speed, so you can see this increase with a numerical value in addition to her visual run speed. Maximum walking speed is this 2.c value. Maximum run speed is 9.c. Note that as I press and release the dash button, it gradually increases. Also note that her run speed doesn't reset just because I release the dash button. Run speed will only reset after releasing forward or otherwise bonking a wall or hitting an enemy. This brings us to the concept of momentum in Super Metroid, which is also extremely important to controlling Samus. Momentum in Super Metroid is an extremely important mechanic for speedrunning. The longer you can keep your momentum, the faster you will be able to move through rooms. It's also important for mock balls, which we'll be discussing in just a minute. As already mentioned, Samus will keep her momentum from holding the dash button as long as you don't release forward until you bonk a wall or enemy. She will also keep that momentum through jumps, but it will reset upon landing in a standing pose. Keeping momentum through jumps can be a bit tricky though, so let's discuss that first. When Samus has run speed momentum when entering a jump, as long as she stays spinning, she'll maintain that momentum until landing. However, if she breaks out of spin for any reason, there are conditions to whether she will keep the momentum or not. If the jump button is held, she will keep it. If an angle button is held, she will keep it. If the shoot button is held, she will keep it. And if the aim down pose or button is held, she will keep it. If any of these actions is performed, and then released prior to another action or button being held, she will lose the momentum. So for example, if we jump with momentum, aim down, and then release the down button before repressing jump or an angle button, she will lose the momentum. You can see this both visually as she slows down. You can also see it with the number decrease prior to her landing in the top left. The same is true for angling and releasing it, and shooting and releasing. There may be other edge cases or scenarios not covered here, but I think I covered the basics. So essentially, anytime that you're breaking spin, if you need to keep your momentum, make sure that you have pressed two or more of the buttons or repress the buttons prior to releasing all of the buttons. For the example of an aim down, you would want to aim down and then make sure that you are also holding jump prior to releasing the down button. So let's talk about mock balls. Mock balls should be one of the first, if not the very first thing you learn for speedrunning Super Metroid. They allow significant sequence breaks and also generally help with faster movement. A few key things are needed to perform a mock ball. First, Samus needs to have dash speed or run speed and needs to hold that forward momentum through a jump. Second, Samus needs to do a soft morph upon landing. And third, the jump button needs to be held when doing the soft morph. Let's use this room as the key example for performing a mock ball as it's the first time that doing a mock ball is required if you intend to sequence break when speedrunning Super Metroid. Notice that if I try to roll across these crumble blocks normally, Samus will fall. 
And if I try to simply run across them, she gets blocked by this gate. To get around these problems, we need to perform a mock ball. We've already discussed dash speed and keeping momentum through jumps. So the next key point to performing a mock ball is to do a soft morph. Note that when Samus lands on the ground in morph ball, she bounces. A soft morph will prevent that bounce and is done by timing your morph animation just before she lands on the ground. You should be aiming down prior to landing and then simply time your next down press to morph as she's about to land. If done correctly, she will not bounce and you will not hear the bouncing sound. Once you have the concept of soft morphing down, the next thing to focus on is rolling forward as you soft morph. This sequence of inputs on the D-pad is the same as performing a Hadouken in Street Fighter or Mega Man X1, if you're familiar with either of those. Essentially, the order of inputs should be down, down forward, and then forward. Similar to wall jumps, the timing window for this is somewhat loose. Last, as mentioned previously, the jump button needs to be held when doing the soft morph and the rolling forward motions, or the mock ball will fail. This mock ball is fairly straightforward, since you can simply hold jump the entire time after coming out of the door. But what about situations where you can't do this? This is where short hop mock balls come into play. One example of a spot that a short hop mock ball is extremely beneficial is when you're coming out of ice beam in categories that need to get back under the gates. Note that if I try to simply run out of the room, I'll get blocked by a gate. To get around this, we need to do a mock ball. Unfortunately, because of the way the ceiling dips down in the previous room, you can't hold jump the whole time and need to do a short jump instead. This is where keeping momentum through jumps is important. Remember, if you break spin and then release all momentum keeping buttons or actions, Samus will lose her momentum midair. So the way a short hop mock ball works is that you need to jump, then release the jump button and aim down in either order. Now here's the important part. In order to morph to perform the mock ball, you will need to release and repress the down button, right? Prior to releasing the down button, you need to repress and hold the jump button. If you don't do this, Samus will lose her momentum and you won't be able to mock ball. Let's do this in slow motion as well, so it's a bit easier to see the inputs. Short hop mock balls are also extremely beneficial for optimizing movement when you're doing mock balls simply to go fast. Alright, time for my favorite aspect of movement tech in Super Metroid, Speed Booster. After collecting Speed Booster, when holding dash for a period of time, Samus will eventually activate it, turning blue and leaving a trail of echoes behind as she runs forward. While in this state, she can break speed booster blocks, kill most types of enemies, and generally just look super awesome. If you've watched Super Metroid speedruns in the past, you've probably noticed speedrunners somehow activating speed booster in really small spaces. This is called short charging. To understand how short charges work, I need to explain how the game activates speed booster in the first place. As Samus is running forward, her animation is constantly changing. One of the frames during the running animation is a special frame, where the game checks to see if the dash button is being held. If it is being held, it increments a counter value by 1, and when that value reaches 4, it activates Speed Booster. There is an option in the practice ROM to show this value. I 
I believe it's the dash counter. One, two, three, four. There are a few ways to look for which frame you need to be holding dash on. The easiest method for me is to watch her arm that is closest to you. As Samus runs forward, that arm will swing back and forth. The magic frame, as they call it, is just after her arm reaches its furthest back point. The idea behind short charging is that you want to hold dash only during that frame or for the shortest period of time surrounding that frame that you can. As the speed booster counter increases, Samus's animation will speed up. Additionally, the sound of her footsteps will also speed up. This is a bit easier to hear if you use headphones than if you're relying on external speakers to play. Because Samus's animation is speeding up as the counter increases, the length of time between each tap gets shorter and shorter, rather than being the consistent rhythm. It sounds like this. Tap, 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 tap. Tap, 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 tap. Tap, 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 tap. Tap, 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 tap. The practice ROM has a tool called Magic Pants that will make Samus turn white each time the frame occurs. Let's turn it on so you can see how it looks. Flash will turn Samus white. Loud will play a beep. Both will do both. Let's start with the flash. Now let's do loud. And of course, both does both. Short charging is somewhat essential for many categories when speedrunning Super Metroid, though it should be noted that a four tap is never required in any major category. Most runners will do two or three taps on average, or a one tap if that's all that's necessary. Let's compare the distance covered for each. Not short charging at all. We get speed booster just before the floor changes here, starting from this block. Doing a one tap, we get it quite a bit shorter. Doing a two tap, even shorter. A three tap, and a four tap. As you can see, there's some diminishing returns in the amount of distance covered, depending on how many taps you're doing. Again, because of this, Usually, only a two or three tap would be required for any given strat. There are some ways to make your short charges even shorter. The first one we'll cover is called stuttering. Remember that the game is checking for the dash button being held on a specific frame of Samus's animation? Well, normally, her running animation cycles by simply holding forward. However, it's also possible to repeatedly press forward on the D-pad with short releases between presses and still keep her animation cycling. This is called stuttering. Pretty neat, right? Stuttering can only be used to shorten distance for short charging until the first tap. After that, releasing forward at all will reset the counter.
Typically, when I stutter, I press forward on the D-pad three times and time my first dash press or tap on the third D-pad press, like this. One, two, tap. One, two, tap. One, two, tap. One, two, tap, 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 tap. One, two, tap, 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 tap. Now let's compare distances again. Let's do a single tap short charge with no stutter. We end up right around here. Now let's do it with a stutter. See the difference? The last way to shorten your short charges is by optimizing the length of time that you are pressing the dash button on your taps. This can be difficult to perfect, as a one frame press is best if you press it on the correct frame, but if you miss the frame, you've messed up your short charge. As a general rule, it's best to focus on the timing of your taps before you worry about the length of time that you're holding the button. The reason a shorter press will help you cover less distance is that for every frame the dash is being held that is not the magic frame, Sam's speed is increasing, and therefore she is covering more distance per frame. Thankfully, there is a great tool in the practice realm to help you tune the time and length of your presses. It's called Shine Tune. I've cleared the other numbers on the info HUD as much as I can, so it's easier to see relevant numbers related to ShineTune. Full descriptions of how ShineTune works can be found on the Practice Realm website in the documentation, but I'll do my best to explain it here as well. So I'm going to do a short charge here. And you see four sets of numbers. 2, 5, 5, 2, 6, 1, 4, 52. 3, 5, 7, 1, 6, 1, 5, 35. 3, 5, 5, 3, 4, 3, 3, 36. So what do all these mean? In this case, what it's telling you is that I held dash for 3 frames before the first tap and 5 frames after the first tap. 5 frames before the second tap and 3 frames after the second tap. 4 frames before the third tap, 3 frames after the third tap, and 3 frames before the fourth tap, and 36 frames after the fourth tap. I'm not sure if that 36 is actually the number of frames that I was holding dash, but it didn't update until I released forward. The reason this is so helpful is because it lets you know essentially how long you're holding the button. It also gives you a general timing of when you press the button. So for example, if I pressed and released early, That fourth tap was pressed five frames before and released one frame before the magic frame. In this case, the first tap was held three frames before, four frames after. The second tap was held six frames before and zero frames after, meaning I released on the perfect frame. Three and four, six and two, seven and zero, two and five, eight, and released one frame early. That L3 means that I was late on the third tap, by three frames to be precise. If you play around with this more, you should get a feel for how it works. It can be extremely useful when diagnosing what is going wrong with a short charge in a specific strat. Okay, okay. So short charging is cool and all, but what's the point if you don't know how to do cool stuff after activating Speed Booster? Let's talk about Shine Sparks first. To charge a Shine Spark, press down after turning blue. Ideally, you want to do this while you're still running forward. If there are any frame gaps between your last forward press and your down press, you will lose Speed Booster and it won't charge. It's easiest to just think of it as rolling on the D-pad from forward to down, like the opposite of a mock ball. After charging the Shine Spark, Samus will begin flashing. 
From this point, you have three seconds to use a shine spark before the timer runs out and she stops flashing. If that happens, you will need to activate Speed Booster again and charge the Shine Spark again. One thing to note is that Shine Sparking uses energy, so make sure you have enough energy before you commit to it. To Shine Spark, there are a few ways to activate it. The first and most basic method is to press the jump button while Samus is stationary. That's it. She will briefly hang in the air. This is called the wind-up animation, and then she will automatically fly upwards. She will continue shine sparking until either she bonks into a ceiling or a floating platform, or until she reaches 29 energy. Once one of these conditions is met, she will stop. There is a 70 frame crash animation that's just over one second in length. After the shine spark crash, Samus enters a falling state until she lands. You can avoid the wind up animation if you hold up prior to pressing jump. You can shine spark in directions other than straight up, too. To shine spark diagonally, hold R or angle up while Samus is stationary, and then press jump. To shine spark horizontally, press and hold jump while Samus is stationary, and then while still holding jump, press forward. Unfortunately, you cannot shine spark downward at all. Sorry about that, Dread fans. You can avoid using a shine spark when jumping while one is charged a few different ways. Mainly, a spin jump will not shine spark. In other words, if Samus is walking or running forward when you press the jump button, she will not shine spark. Additionally, if you're holding the angle down button and do a straight jump, Samus will not shine spark. This is only applicable from a standing pose, and will not work from a crouched pose. Remember when I said that you should keep angle down mapped and not sacrifice it for another action? This is just one of the reasons why. There are some edge cases when you're underwater without a gravity suit where you can prevent shine sparks from being used as well. This is only applicable to you if you have a spike suit or a flash suit, but it's still good to know. I can show those quickly here. First, I'm going to unequip the gravity suit. Then I'm going to give myself a shine spark. So like usual, if you hold angle down and press jump, she won't use it. But also, when you're moving underwater without gravity suit, you can hold shoot and jump, and she won't use it. You can also hold down and jump, and she won't use it. This can be very useful for traversing suitless sections while holding onto a spike suit. Okay, back to normal situations here. Shine sparks can be activated from midair as well but only from a jumping state, so not from a falling state, as discussed earlier in this video. To activate a shine spark in midair, Samus needs to be in a jumping state in the air, and then you can activate it by pressing up or angle up. The rest of the inputs are the same as from a stationary standing pose. Shine sparks will also automatically activate in the air in a couple of situations. Mainly, if jump is being held in a situation where Samus is airborne, breaks spin, moves forward, and then stops moving forward, a shine spark will automatically activate, or immediately after stopping a deboost if it's ended before landing. So notice the shine spark activated there after I pressed and then released forward after breaking spin by shooting. The same thing will also happen if you break spin with an angle down and then continue to hold jump without holding angle down. And 
And there's the deboost example. All right, that should be enough about Shine Sparks. So what else can we do with Speed Booster? A couple of useful things can be done relating to Mach Balls. Let's take a quick look. First of all, a Mach Ball done while Speed Booster is activated is called a Speed Ball. This is particularly useful in situations where you need to break certain blocks while also going fast. A Speed Ball has all the same properties as Speed Booster does while Samus is on the ground, including killing most types of enemies. Unfortunately, if the Morph Ball is airborne with Speed Booster, that particular piece doesn't apply, and Samus will take damage and bonk on the enemy instead. Another neat thing that can be done with Speed Balls is something called a Blue Keep, sometimes mistakenly called a Speed Keep. A Blue Keep can be done by unmorphing out of a Speed Ball while holding an angle button. Samus will unmorph and stop but keep the speed booster state and all of its properties until either jumping and landing in a standing state or turning around. This can also be particularly useful for getting through certain types of blocks in a couple of strats in major categories. That's everything that we're going to cover about speed booster today in this video. Okay, almost done. Just a couple more quick tidbits here. There's a piece of movement tech called kegoing. First, I'll show you where this tech got its name. This enemy is called a Kago. Notice that it's a solid enemy. Samus cannot run through it normally. However, if you jump and then time a morph on the correct frame, Samus will enter the enemy. Similar things can be done with other enemies, relating to Samus's turn animation as well as the morph animation. Why is this? Samus has a few animations that are considered uninterruptible animations. Off the top of my head, these are turnarounds, morphing, and unmorphing. We can use uninterruptible animations to our advantage, to keep momentum or speed when it would otherwise be reset. The first example is kegoing through enemies. The other example is quick drops through crumble blocks. Both are extremely useful for optimizing movement in Super Metroid speedruns. The easiest way to take advantage of this movement tech is to aim down prior to the turnaround that you are going to do. Remember, when Samus is in the aim down pose, her hitbox shrinks, and then expands when exiting the aim down pose. The same thing applies here when turning around from an aim down pose. Let's take a look at this enemy here. Normally, when running off the elevator, if you fall and hit the enemy, Samus's speed is going to be reset. However, if you do a Kago or a turnaround, she keeps her fall speed here. Now let's take a look at these crumble blocks. Normally when landing on crumble blocks, Samus lands and then falls through after resetting her fall speed. However, if you drop through the crumble blocks during a turnaround animation, notice that her fall speed does not reset. In this particular case, that can be used to jump back up through before the crumble blocks reappear. Very useful. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about in this video. You may have heard Super Metroid runners refer to Dopplering their shots. This refers to a real-world physics concept called the Doppler effect. I won't bore you with the details of that, and I'd probably get them wrong if I even tried. In Super Metroid terms, to Doppler a shot means that a projectile was fired when Samus was moving forward. The resulting projectile will move faster than it would had Samus been standing stationary when she fired it. Essentially, the projectile is adding Samus's forward speed to its own base speed, this tech is extremely important for modern Fantoon fights in every category, which uses the Doppler effect on missiles to keep Fantoon stunlocked. It can even be used to complete the Fantoon fight in a single round or cycle, when traditionally it would normally take two or more to finish the fight. One thing to note is that when a shot is Dopplered, it will be positioned one pixel higher than had it been shot when standing stationary. 
There are some edge cases where this is useful, for example, opening doors with your beam when it may not otherwise open. I've turned off all of the beams here so that I can easily illustrate the differences. Holding shoot here, Samus will repeatedly fire her beam. This is called a P shot. The first two shots are spaced pretty close together. However, if I move forward between the first and second shot, notice the second shot is hitting the wall much closer to the first shot than if they're both shot standing stationary. Additionally, relating to the pixel positioning, if Samus is standing stationary here and fires the P shot, it gets blocked by this edge block. However, if Samus is moving forward and fires the P shot, it actually goes through the top of the block and breaks all of the shot blocks behind. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you've seen my other general movement tutorials in the past, I hope you enjoyed the format of this one and any newer information that I added to it as well. I'm hoping to do more tutorials in the future using this same layout and a similar format to try and improve the clarity of how strats are performed and make it easier to digest the information one piece at a time. If you're new to my channel and you enjoyed this content, feel free to browse through my other tutorials for more in-depth analysis on various Super Metroid categories that I've speedrun over the years. If you'd like to, you can also catch me streaming live both here on YouTube and on my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash shinyzenny. I don't have a set schedule, but as of the time of uploading this video, I stream most weekdays in the afternoon evening and most weekends in the morning afternoon. Also, if you feel like it, you can like and subscribe and all that stuff. Supposedly that's helpful for YouTube algorithm discovery stuff. I don't really know, to be honest. Thank you again for watching. I really hope that this was useful to you, and I hope to see you around.